648. Now I belong to Jesus. Amen. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him, no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to him. Good morning. It is really good to see everybody this morning. All right. I want to say thank you for praying for the Lethbridge meeting. That meeting went went well. Man, there was a lot of uh, battle going on. It seems like anytime the Lord is trying to do something, uh, sometimes there's a lot of opposition, but sometimes it's really visible. This time around, they had literally just like... The, the, the day, the morning of the meeting, there were two deaths um, uh, of family members in the church. And, um, and, and of course, I broke my ankle and uh, just, you know, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, you, could, you could really tell there was a real battle. There was at least one person saved during the meeting. There were a lot of people responding, a lot of young people, a lot of young families. Um, it was it was a good meeting, and so I want to thank everybody that prayed. Um, I want to thank everybody that helped take care of the services. Uh, you know, everybody stepped in, did all sorts of things behind the scenes, and and I want to thank everybody that took care of those things. And I want to thank everybody that prayed for my ankle. Um, you know, I broke it a week ago yesterday morning, and. Um, and, you know, people were saying to me in Lethbridge, they said, oh, man, in a couple of days, it's really going to be hurting. And, you know, by the grace of God, that has not been the case. I've had almost no pain. Um, you know, it gets irritated, it gets swollen, um, but, um, but really it hasn't been bad at all. Um, uh, I would ask your prayers, of course, obviously, that it will heal properly. But the other side of that is 
um, you know, they told me the day I got hurt, they said, if you don't hear from an orthopedic specialist within three days, call this number. And uh, I think it's a, uh, a contact number for an orthopedic specialist at the uh, Royal Alexander Hospital. So I called and the lady said, oh, yeah. She said, he's looked at your x-rays and uh, she said, you'll be hearing from us. And so I still haven't heard anything. So um, we're going to, you know, call tomorrow. And uh, so just just pray that, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to, to know what's going on and all that sort of thing. Um, a report on Brother Workington. Brother Workington had his surgery um, last Tuesday. And that was a very serious surgery. There was a 40% chance that he would not survive the surgery. And, um, but he did, he came through, there was a big, there was a big mass in his, on his stomach and on his pancreas and it was cancer. And, uh, they think they got it all. Um, he is in good spirits. I've heard from him a couple times now. Um, he'll be in the hospital recovering for another week and then he'll have three months of recovery at home. So praise the Lord for that. So remember to, um, uh, a lot of you guys know Brother Workington, continue to pray for him. If you have not turned your phones off, if you could help us with that, we sure would appreciate that. And we will dismiss all the little guys eight and under. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 33 this morning. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, it says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning and uh, breathe upon us. And, and Lord, let the, uh, let the message accomplish thy purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. And of course, we've been going through Deuteronomy 33, and we're in verse 24. It says, And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. We're going to talk about the blessing that was given to the tribe of Asher. You know, we've been working our way through these and um, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what we want to do with the tribe of Asher this morning is we want to draw some real spiritual applications from this. There's some real instruction in righteousness. Now, these prophecies would be literally fulfilled and are still being fulfilled for them. But, you know, a lot of these things that were written, the Bible says, now these things were our examples. And uh, man, the Lord gives all sorts of pictures throughout the Bible. Um, the blessing to Asher would literally be fulfilled. But there is a, a picture here. There's instruction here, as we have seen, as we've looked at the other tribes. And in these verses about Asher, you see some of the greatest blessings of the Christian life. Uh, you see blessings in this life and blessings through the entire span of your life. Some blessings that you and I receive are one-time events. You know, you know, every once in a while, there's just, you know, a really special blessing that falls your lot, and um, you may not see another blessing like that for years. It's just something really special. It's just for you, and um, it might be a one-time event. There are other blessings that happen every so often, but there are lifelong blessings blessings. David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And Asher is the last tribe in the list that is blessed. And, um, you know, God often saves the best for last. 
The Bible says many that are first shall be last. And uh, you, think, you say, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people that are, that are first, you know, they're, they're, pr- they're so promising. They're, they're gifted. They're in the limelight. They're, they have a big name. They're movers and shakers. They got a lot of money. Um, you know, a lot of those people in the, in the final reckoning will actually not come out at the head of the pack. They'll actually be somewhere in last place. Not all of them, but many. Many that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. You know, a lot of times it's the lowly people, the hidden people. Uh, They were weak. They were small. They were unimportant. They were unnoticed. And yet someday in the big picture, when the Lord passes out his rewards, you'll see a lot of the people that seem to be in last place. They actually come out in first place. And God saves the best for last. Solomon said, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The Bible says about Job that the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And as believers, often the best comes last. It says in 1 Peter, we look forward to this, receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. In John 6, Jesus said, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Look with me if you would at 1 Corinthians 15. Keep your place in Deuteronomy 33. But look at 1 Corinthians 15 with me. First Corinthians 15. Verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And notice, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. In other words, you know, at the end, God comes back and he takes over and he makes everything like it should have been. Verse 25, for he must reign till he hath put all things under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God saves the best for last. Look at Revelation 10 for just a moment. Revelation 10. Verse 1. And of course, Revelation is all about the last things. Revelation 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, 
and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. You know, um, um, you ever read a book and you come to the end of the book and there'll be those two little words underneath the last chapter that says, the end. And you know, God saves the best for last. And the best is coming. You know, there's an old saying, he who laughs last, laughs best. They laugh at us now. And they laugh at Jesus Christ now. But he who laughs last, laughs best. For the believer, and when we use that term, we're talking about the ones that have been transformed by Jesus Christ. They're, they're defined as those who love him, love him. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. In other words, let him be doomed and damned at the coming of Jesus Christ. It's not about just saying you believe something or nodding your head and agreeing. It's, it's about a heartfelt love. It's about a relationship that has been entered into voluntarily and a commitment that's been made, a commitment of love. We love him because he first loved us. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. For the believer, for the one transformed in Jesus Christ, the best comes last. You know, they have their troubles in this world. You know, Jesus said, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. You know, we're, we're not home yet. You know, this world is cursed and we, we live in a body that's decaying. And, you know, uh, things morally are decaying. You know, we see all that stuff all around us. But, but, you know, the best is coming. For the believer, the best comes last. You know, heaven is what comes last. We are with the Lord, finally. I mean, visibly with the Lord. We're in that place where there is no sin and no sadness ever again and no death and we have everlasting joy upon our heads. God saves the best for last. Asher is the last tribe blessed. And look what he says to Asher. He says several things, and we're just going to touch on one of those this morning. In Deuteronomy 33. And of Naphtali, I'm sorry, verse 24. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. You know, um, when, when that blessing fell on that tribe, you know, it meant that there was something divine that God was going to do to multiply that family. That family line was going to keep on going. It's interesting as you read the Old Testament how God re re uh, refers to the fathers and the children. You know, he'll talk about, uh, you know, the children of Ephraim. You know, well, good grief, you know, hundreds of years have passed. But the Lord looks at it and he, he goes way back to the book of Genesis and he says, these dudes, hundreds of years later, they're still the children of so and so. You know, um, the family line keeps going, it doesn't die out, it doesn't fade away. The family line would multiply. They're in Lethbridge. I can't remember who I was talking to. And they were telling me about their family. And, and, um, and they said uh, they recently counted and there were between 72 and 73 grandchildren. And they said, and then they threw in that. La and of course, that doesn't even count the great grandchildren. You know what that, you know what those 72 grandchildren started with? Two people. They were blessed with children. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. But we want to liken this this morning 
to that spiritual side and spiritual children. Jesus said in John 15, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. In Proverbs 11, he said, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And you say, well, what is that? Well, the next phrase says, And he that winneth souls is wise. So that the fruit of that tree is people. You know, um, you know, somebody that's never had children physically can still have spiritual children. You know, somebody can get saved at 70 years old and still have spiritual children. Yes, there is the fruit of the Spirit, certainly. But there is this fruit also, spiritual children. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, and uh, let's look at uh, verse 13. Romans 1, verse 13. Paul says, Now I would not have you ignorant. He's writing to the, um, to the Romans, to the Roman believers. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. He was hindered. He couldn't get there that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now, what is he referring to there? Verse 14 and 15. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's talking about people being saved. He's talking about the gospel reaching people and people turning to Christ because they hear the gospel. And he says, you know, he said, I've wanted to get to you guys. He said, I wanted to preach there too. He said, because I wanted some fruit among you. Children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Look at 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4. First Corinthians 4. Verse 14. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4:14 4, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Paul had been to Corinth. Paul had been the one that by the grace of God had started that church. So these people, uh, many of them that he was writing to were very directly his converts. Verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, he said, you know, teachers are everywhere. Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Man, he had birthed some children there in Corinth. He had been blessed with children. You don't have to turn there, but in Philemon, a lot of you guys remember we were in Philemon a couple months back. In Philemon, in that book, Paul writes to him, and he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. It wasn't a physical son. He said, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He said, I led him to Jesus Christ from my prison cell. You know what Paul said to Timothy? He said, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Well, that wasn't physical. Because the Bible tells us that Timothy's son, Timothy's father, was a Greek. And Paul was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. He said unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. You ever had somebody run your family tree? You know, um, some people do that, and, and uh, man, they're able to go way back. And 
And uh, somebody in our family, in Mits on Mitzi's side of the family, did it. And they got back several generations, and they found some stuff they didn't like, and so they said, "Stop. We don't know what to know. we don't want to know anymore." You know, in the old Bibles, especially, you know, that people used to have big family Bibles on there. It used to be a big thing when we were kids. There were these guys that went around selling these things, and I mean, they were massive. No joke, they were like this big. And they were like this thick, you know, great big, large print. And, you know, it had some neat features and a lot of neat pictures in them. And, and they were selling those and they were sort of a, just a um, sort of a, something that you would treasure in your family. And in the opening pages, and actually probably in some of your Bibles, you've got those opening pages where you can write in your family tree. The Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. It's a family tree. Life begets life. You know, bearing fruit sort of works like this in, in the natural realm. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, take, take plants and seeds. And of course, you know what the, the Lord does? The Lord likens uh, the gospel to the sowing of seed. He does it in a few places in the gospels. He said, the sower soweth the word and then the word fell in several different places. In some places, it didn't bring forth any fruit. Some places, it brought up a little that just disappeared. And you know, you know, you guys remember that the parable that the Lord told. So bearing fruit sort of look, works like this: um, you have good seed, and um, you plant that seed, and you know the the beans grow, you know, or the that fruit tree grows or whatever. And eventually it produces something. You know, you plant, uh, you plant one kernel of corn and let's say you get two, two, two ears of corn on the stalk. Well, man alive, you have multiplied that seed, you know, a few hundred times. Now, back in the old days, they would take some of their harvest and they would dry that seed and they would save it. You know, some of it they canned and some of it they did all sorts of stuff with. But they would save some of it to replant. So you'd have the good seed and it would bring forth some fruit. And then there'd be more seed and it would bring forth some fruit. And it just kept on going. But that doesn't happen with hybrid seed. Hybrid seed the life stops after that hybrid is produced. The seed of that hybrid is sterile. In other words, it doesn't, you can't do anything with it to, as far as reproduction. For example, mules. Mules are sterile. You know, there's a difference between a donkey and a mule. Um, you know what a mule is? A mule is when you take a male donkey and a female horse and you breed them. And that brings forth a mule. But you can't mate a mule with a mule. You get nothing. There's no reproduction from that point on. A hybrid is formed by the breeding of two unlike varieties or species. And you get a creature or a plant that cannot reproduce. The life-giving quality is gone. The only way a hybrid variety, and you know, it's really crazy in our society. Um, any of you that have grown gardens, more and more and more, um, you know, most of your seed is hybrid. The only way a hybrid variety continues is to keep going back to the person breeding those unlike plants or animals because they don't reproduce on their own. There is a hybrid Christianity that is like that. And a lot of the cults are like that. And what they've done is they've combined a mixture of some things that do not go together. So if you don't go back to their leader, they cease to exist. That's why there's people that they get caught up in some of these movements. And some of them are Baptist. I mean, there's all sorts of them. And um, they're so bound to that personality that... Um, there is no true life there. If that guy died tomorrow or a bad report came out about him, 
um, that, that movement would crumble. But you know, that's not the way it works with, with Jesus Christ. The maniac of Gadara meets Jesus Christ. And immediately, he is able to spread light through Decapolis. The woman at the well in John 4 meets Jesus Christ. And immediately, she spreads life through her town. And that, that, that fruit just keeps rolling because she paves the way for Philip and revival in Acts chapter 8. You know, Jesus said, I am the life. The life. A lot of you guys are, ladies are familiar with Billy Graham. And, and you know, um, Billy Graham was really an unusual character in a lot of ways. And there's, you know, some controversy over him. And of course, I think, um, I think, is he dead now? Yeah, he's passed away. And, you know, you'll always hear this question. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, we, we know there were some issues and there were some things wrong, but, but boy, weren't there, weren't there so many saved under his ministry? And the answer to that question is yes, especially in the early days. But he totally swung a different direction by the midpoint of his ministry. You hit about 1972. I saw this. I watched it. I heard it with my own ears. He's preaching in Los Angeles in one of his campaigns. And he blatantly says he no longer believes in a burning hell. Now, 22 years previous, he was hellfire and damnation. At the end of his life, I heard an interview. I had the re- I've got the recording at home somewhere. It, you can readily, you could, you could order it. I can tell you where you can get it. It was a public interview with Robert Schuler at the Crystal Cathedral. And Billy Graham said, all sincere moral people go to heaven no matter what religion they're from. I heard one person describe his ministry like this. He reaped a harvest. He did. But he wrecked the orchard. You know, we've reached a point, you know, we're not, you know, discernment is sorely lacking among God's people. And, you know, it's, it's, you get this thing where, where if anybody gets saved by anybody else, they think, well, you know, we just really can't say anything. Well, praise the Lord, somebody got saved. Well, you know, yeah, amen. I, I say praise the Lord, somebody got saved. But, um, but, you know, it's, it's like you've got an orchard or you've got a garden, you know, or you've got a, you've got a bunch of fruit trees in your yard and, and you hire, uh, you hire somebody to come and, and pick your fruit. You know, they've got that, you know, uh, every year you've got those migrant guys that come up from Mexico and they'll hit Portage La Prairie and several other places and they'll, they'll hit the orchards, they'll hit the potato fields and they, they do all the harvest work. Can you imagine, you know, you've got this, this bunch of fruit trees and you're just really glad to, you know, you're not feeling well and, you know, it's getting to be too much for you. So you hire this dude and he's got his crew and they come in and they, they, they reap the harvest, you know, and, and they, they roll by and you see all the baskets of fruit and, you know, you're clicking off dollar signs in your head and you're going, wow, praise the Lord, you know, and you're thinking, you know, and they were cheap labor too. And you're thinking about all the money you're going to make. And, and, you know, a little while later, you take a walk through the vineyard. You take a walk through the orchard and the limbs are broken and the trees are knocked over. There won't be another harvest. Oh, so, so they reaped the harvest, did they? Would you be pleased with that? Would you go praise the Lord? Would you look with me at Jeremiah 12? You know, it would really help us once in a while if we would just stop and think. If we could just shut the computer off for a little while, and spend some serious time letting the Bible speak for itself and just go, oh my goodness, does this mean what it says? Wow, what a difference it would make! I read this just the other day, and it jumped out at me. Jeremiah 12, verse 10. Look what the Lord said. Jeremiah 12, verse 10. Many pastors 
have destroyed my vineyard. And in case you, I don't know if you noticed or not, but in the little, in the Hebrew right there beside it, there's a frowny face. <laughs> it doesn't sound like the Lord's happy here. Who are these pastors? You say, well, the Lord calls pastors. Oh, yeah. And he is not happy. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate. And being desolate, it mourneth unto me. God says the ground is crying. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. You know, um, as long as some of these preached truth was like, but suddenly, suddenly, they turned it into a hybrid. And the life-giving quality ended. The incorruptible seed of the Word of God was replaced by a seed and a message that was sterile. And it's still happening today. I mean, it's, we, are, we are eat up with it in North America. You've got modern teachers and preachers. And have they, have they led some people to the Lord? They have. And as soon as you acknowledge that, you know, you've got all, all these Christian people with no discernment. And suddenly that just seems to justify everything. Well, you know, you know, well, my neighbor down the street, he got saved watching his video. Well, you know what? I'm glad he got saved. I don't take that away from him. But you do remember, do you not, that Judas was one of the 12. And he preached and he did miracles and he cast out devils. And people rejoiced. The people that really got healed by Judas, they really got healed. But did that make Judas anything but a devil? Did not Jesus say as he looked at them one day, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? But the Christianity that many propagate is a hybrid. It has strange things mixed in and other things left out. And it only reproduces clones of its leader. It does not produce sons of God or followers of Jesus Christ. Without going back to their leader, that movement would die out. Look at Acts chapter 5. Without going back to their leader. You know, some of these, some of these folks, their, their whole movement really, you know, they use the name of Jesus Christ, but it's built on their own hybrid. Okay. And so without that leader, the thing would disintegrate. It would splinter. And, you know, there was a wise old Jew. He was a doctor of the law, and he acknowledged that. He made an interesting statement in Acts chapter 5. Peter and the other disciples are on trial. And um, there's a lot of dispute going on about them. And, and, um, and in Acts 5, 34, look what it says. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. And by the way, this is the guy that trained the apostle Paul in his lost days. Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. He was no dummy had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put forth the, the apostles forth a little space. In other words, he's, you know, this trial's going on and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, you know, they're, they're just seeing red. They're just so mad they can't see straight. They, they want to see these apostles put away or, or killed. And Gamaliel stands up and he's the big dog. Like he's the one they all look up to. And Gamaliel says, whoa, 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 whoa. Gamaliel says, I think we need to give them a little room to breathe. And why did he say that? Look at verse 35. And said unto them, ye men of Israel, 
Take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain. Suddenly the leader got knocked off, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. He's saying, guys, do you realize they're, they're, they're no threat to you? Leave them alone. Verse 38. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. He says, it's going to fizzle out. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. He said, you know, he said, I know enough about God. And he didn't really even know the living God very well at all. He said, I know enough about God to know that if he's in it, you're not going to stop it. Because real Christianity is a tree of life. It has reproduced itself for the last 2,000 years. Because the seed is incorruptible and the life is Jesus Christ. Yes, one soweth and another reapeth. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And we're talking about having spiritual children and, and the great blessing for us is the opportunity to have some spiritual children. Um, and we know that that's a lot of times there's a lot of people in on that. You know, let's say that today, let's say that today at the end of the service, you know, somebody uh, came up to one of our guys or one of our ladies and said, man, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I want to be saved. And, you know, that person would lead them to the Lord. And that would be absolutely wonderful. We would praise the Lord for that. Well, the person that led them to the Lord, man, they're a key player in that. But we also know that oftentimes there's many players in that, in that episode. There's people that witnessed. There's people that prayed and all that. We know that one soweth and another reapeth. But someone sowed the seed. And the seed brought forth fruit. One of the greatest blessings of the Christian life is to be blessed with spiritual children. The spiritual children are the folks that say, I'm saved today because so-and-so told me about Jesus Christ. I'm saved today because they didn't give up on me. I'm saved today because they prayed for me. Now, we're talking about on the earthly side of things, okay? I'm saved today because I saw Jesus Christ in them. You know, uh, one of the greatest blessings of the Christian life is when you have a part, and it, it may not be the only part, but for you to have part in other people coming to Jesus Christ. Because this thing is a family. God called it the family in heaven and earth, and it keeps propagating and it keeps propagating because somebody's sowing good seed. And God says, I'm going to give you credit for that. You're part of that. Some of it is only visible on heaven's side. You know, it's like the track that got left on somebody's windshield. When we lived in Pennsylvania, we had a young man showed up one night. He was, I don't know, 22, 23. And um, uh, he talked to one of the guys at the door. Before the night was over, he he gave a testimony and he said, you know, I'm here tonight. He said, I didn't grow up in church. He said, um, he said, and somebody from this church put a track on my windshield. How many times have you done that? You know, how many times have you put a track somewhere, you know, and people do it all the time on a bench or, or, you know, uh, um, you know, I had a friend that used to stick it in the pants at Walmart and until, <laughs> and, and, until secure, until security caught him on camera. And, and uh, how many times has a track been left somewhere? You have no idea. That guy said, I read that track. It told me what to do. And I got saved. You know, um, there'll be a lot of that. You say, well, man, I don't know if I have any spiritual children. Well, are you, are you sowing the good seed? You know, are you, are you sowing the good seed of the word of God? Um, 
You know, the Bibles that get purchased for missionaries or the money that you send to a missionary or whatever that helps them, that helps them keep going or whatever. Um, what about that breakthrough in prayer that occurs? There's a breakthrough. Um, J.O. Frazier was a missionary to the Lysu um, and, uh, in the 1900s, and, and um, he went there as a single missionary. He labored there for many years as a single missionary. He learned their language. The Lysu were a people that inhabited uh, the mountain places in China, and they lived at extremely high altitudes, and um, they, they were despised by the Chinese. They were a, just a native ethnic group that lived way out in the middle of nowhere. And um, J.O. Frazier went out there, and he lived with them, and he learned their language, and he began to preach to them, and they loved him, but they were a very wicked, I mean, very wicked group. Um, he said they had in their language, they had 200 different words for how to skin a person alive and no word for love. And when they skin him alive, it's not like when you even say, well, I'm going to skin Johnny alive. No, no, no. They had words for that because they did it. If they caught a woman cheating on her husband, they didn't kill her. She died a natural death as they skinned her alive. And he said they, they would invite demons that had these huge things where everything would go crazy and all of a sudden evil spirits would possess two or three of their people. He said it was just unbelievable. But all that to say, he, um, that's, that's where he was. That's who he was, you know, you, know you, you try to reach some people and you think, oh, these people are so hard to reach. Well, you know, I don't know about that. He said they loved me. He said they accepted me as one of their own. They knew I didn't participate. They knew I was trying to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, I would have the odd family that would supposedly get converted. But he said within a week or two, they had their idols back up and they were just, he said, that happened several times where I thought, oh, I finally got a convert. And he said, it didn't last a week or two. Sound familiar? You know, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. That happens to everybody. And he said, uh, I wrote to my mom back home. And he said, Mom, was a sweet Christian lady that loved the Lord. And he said, Mom, would you please gather a few godly folks whose prayers you trust? And would you meet as often as you can? And he said, I'll send you names and places. And he said, but would you please pray very specifically that God would break through and that these people would be freed from their, their devil worship. And he said, but I know that it will absolutely be a divine event. He said, but mom, would you pray? So she began to pray. Now, by this time, he'd been there for a few years. They began to pray. And he said, in a few months, it happened. He said, all of a sudden, one family got converted. And then another family got converted. And then it was 20 families. And then it was the next village. And in the next little while, hundreds and hundreds of people were converted and they never turned back. You know who, uh, you know who helped birth those? You say, well, J.O. Frazier, Frazier, Frazier was their um, spiritual father, and he was. But you know who else gets credit for birthing them into the spiritual world? Those people back home that prayed and pleaded with God because God didn't move until they prayed. You know, it was considered a curse in Bible days to have no children. You remember in Genesis 30, verse 1, Rachel says to Jacob, because Rachel was frustrated because Leah was having all these kids, you know, and, and, um, and Rachel one day looked at Jacob and said, give me children or else I die. She was desperate. In 1 Samuel 2, we were talking about this recently, Hannah is barren. And that was the term. When a woman had no ch children, she was barren. But again, this, you know, this whole polygamy thing, her, the, the other wife was having a bunch of kids. And, and Hannah prays and it says, and finally the Lord remembered her. And Samuel was born. And she prayed in 1 Samuel 2. And, and that prayer, man, she is absolutely over the moon with her rejoicing. 
And she says, although she's only had one child and she's speaking prophetically under the Holy Ghost, she said, the barren hath born seven. Let Asher be blessed with children, spiritual children, the children that God gives. You know, children don't come without labor or labor pains. There was a lady when Lethbridge, we were just there, and uh, she was due. She didn't have her baby till I think yesterday morning. And, um, you know, all you ladies, you know what that's all about. And uh, wow, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, when a child is born, it's usually because um, somebody, I'm talking about a spiritual child, somewhere, somebody was in labor. They had prayed and prayed and pleaded and worked. Now, sure, the right person walks up and maybe gives them a few verses and they bow their head and pray. And, and you think, oh, it's, it's easy. Oh, that was easy, but it didn't come easy. You remember the Bible way of farming? You know, they're big 16 wheel tractors. You remember? You know, the Bible way of farming, there was no air conditioned tractor with the radio and the little fridge and the GPS. No. The Bible way of farming was, you know, it started early and they hooked up the animals and they had to clear the land by hand and they plowed slowly by hand. And then they had to break the hard ground and get the trees out and get the rocks out by hand. And then if they were planting something with rows, they had to mark the rows. And then they had to plant by hand. And then they prayed for rain. And then they pulled for weeds. And all the little kids rejoiced as they went out weeding. <laughs> and they watched and they hoped for the blessing of God. It was time and labor. There's an amazing verse in Isaiah 66. It says, for as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth children. Paul looked at the Galatians, and the Galatians were a mess. And Paul says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again. He said, man, I birthed you once. I didn't think I was going to have to do it again. But how did he, how did the Galatian church come into being? One man travailed. But oh, the blessing when those spiritual children come. Look at John 16. You know, I don't know what you want this morning, Christian. And, and you probably want a lot of good things. But there ought to be a burning desire in your heart, Christian, to have some children, to be a part in somebody else come to know the Lord. You get to heaven one day and somebody comes up and hugs your neck and you say, who are you? And they say, oh, you, you sent that missionary, you prayed, or somebody you do know that, you haven't seen, you haven't seen in years, but you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. Somebody you, you did know personally and you prayed and they come up and they say, thank you for the part you played. I'm here today because of what you poured in to my soul. Do you want children? We all want a bunch of good stuff, don't we? we and it's, it's good stuff. We want security. We want peace. You know, we want freedom. You know, we want some nice stuff. And you know what? Truth be told, we've got all that. And, you know, we probably just want a bunch more. But, um, but you know, I think God looks down and, and God is good. And, and God gives you lots of those things, is he not? It Doesn't he just give you all sorts of good stuff? Hey, he doesn't have to. He can make you go bankrupt tomorrow. He can take your health tomorrow. But you know what he's done? He's just blessed you. And he's just blessed you. I wonder sometimes if he doesn't look down and think, Man, I wish they'd aim a little higher. Man, I wish they'd ask me for something that would last forever. Man, I wish they'd get in on my plan. I wish they'd help me build my family. But I think there's a lot of Christians, you know, honest to goodness, it doesn't really dawn on, it doesn't dawn on them. They think, oh, you know, oh, the preacher will do that. Oh, you know, Johnny Spiritual will do that. No, he wants, <laughs> he's got a place for you. He's hoping you'll get in on it. Look at John 16, verse 21. John 16, verse 21. You ladies, you can identify with this verse. John 16, verse 21. 
A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. You know, that's never a real upbeat moment, you know, when they're in the, when they're in the throes of labor. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, man, when that baby's born, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Man, I saw all my kids get born. And I saw, uh, uh, I, 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 of course, I was there with my wife and my mom was there when one of the babies was born. My mom had never seen a natural birth. And I mean, it, you know, I, I'm sure it's true for a lot of you ladies, you know, that those last few moments and sometimes those last few hours are just absolute agony, just agony. And, um, but all of a sudden, here it comes. And the baby's out. I have watched my wife. She went from agony to tears of joy. I saw my mom. She started laughing and crying. And the pain is forgotten for joy that a child is born. You say, I got some people I'm praying for, but it's wearing me out. Oh, ho, ho. don't let up. <laughs> oh, it just grieves me. It hurts me. I want them saved so bad. Oh, maybe you're getting close. Maybe the delivery is close. Pray. Life begets life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I give unto them eternal life. So I got a question for you. Do you have his life? Maybe you're here this morning and you're, 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 you sort of understand, but you're having a hard time identifying. I just got a question for you. Do you have his life? This is the greatest blessing of all. He that hath the Son hath life. Is the Son of God alive in your soul? Do you remember the day when you realized He died for you and He rose from the dead and you called on His name and He changed your life? He that hath the Son hath life. And uh, do you have His life? You know, if you don't, man, it's just, it's just, it's just waiting. The gift of God. It's, it's wrapped and ready. It's got your name on it. The gift of God. God says, oh, won't you take it? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Christian, do you have children in Christ? And maybe, maybe you haven't been saved very long, and that's okay. You know, and this is new to you. Christian, have you been a part? I mean, you don't have to imagine it. You, you know you know. there's some people you have been a part in their salvation. Do you want that blessing? Do you want it? Jesus said, ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, man, I've been saved for a long time and I don't know that I've ever, I don't know that I've ever been a part in somebody's salvation. You know what the Lord wants to do? The Lord, uh, man, he's, uh, he's looking for you. He's calling your name. He's saying, uh, would you help me? I, got, I, got, I, I want some more children here. Would you help me? Jesus said, ask. You, you, some of you in this room, you've asked for a lot of things this week and they were probably all good. But why don't you ask for one of the greatest blessings of all? Oh, dear God, would you let me? Lord, I want to start watching. I want to start looking. I want to start praying. Lord, lead me. Help me. I want to be a part of somebody else being born into your family. Do you want that blessing? Ask. Let's pray. Lord, it is a precious truth. God, would you help all of us? Lord, breathe on us this morning. Lord, may people hear your voice this morning. Would they hear your voice? Lord, would they say yes to you this morning? 
with all their heart. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to Him? Lord, thank you for your book. Bless this truth to our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.